released in 1985 after a shit show production and the TV budget fucking falling through, Megazone 23 went on to become the first successful straight to video OVA anime that wasn't hentai, and there was a huge pile of great OVA animes that we would have never gotten if this gem didn't exist. The first part ended on a cliffhanger, which is kinda strange considering that another part wasn't originally planned. But luckily for us, we ended up getting a sequel that finished off the story in 1986. Then, in 1989, an embarrassing part 3 that completely fucks part 1 and 2's ending came out, being nothing more than a cash grab Akira clone that I'm gonna dogpile on later among a few other things. Part 1 is set in the 80's world of punk rock, idols, and our main protagonist, Shogo Yahagi. The famous Popeye to leave is on every screen and everyone's hooked on her newest tracks. The movie's a pretty standard slice of life for the first 10 minutes until about Shogo's friend Shinji gives him the garland, a huge red bike that turns into a cyborg robot packing heat. This thing is gorgeous and whoever designed it deserves a medal. The tone completely flips when Shinji's killed in a shootout with men in suits, and the rest of the movie the government agents are chasing down Shogo to get the garland back. These men are led by BD, who we'll talk about later too. While Shogo's half on the run from the government, a relationship builds between him and a girl named Yui. Yui's a dancer late to work that Shogo almost runs over at the beginning. She's also roommates with his two other friends from the beginning. Film girl and can't sing for shit. Tamami and Shogo stumble on an underground city that is seemingly impossible. The gravity's off and it's a complete ghost town. Shogo gets in after a fight with BD that lands them all the way into space, and Shogo finds out from him that their entire world is a lie being made up by a supercomputer. They're not actually living in the 1980s. They're living 500 years past the 80s on a spaceship called the Megazone 23. <laughs> Title. And they're at war with aliens that we'll never see, and the government are the only ones that know about it, and they're currently working to hack into Bahamut and gain control of it so that they'd have all the power in the world. In a long game of cat and mouse, Shogo finds out that Eve is nothing more than an AI. In a horrifying scene as we see one of her shows broken down into a 3D animation and Shogo's horror. As the war gets worse with the aliens, Eve has flipped from the love pop we've heard the entire movie to government war propaganda. BD overthrows his superiors, taking down the government and positioning himself as the commander. <laughs> And his first order? The heat kicks up to its peak after Film Girl gets killed. Shogo and his friends come back and find her corpse. Shogo, in a fit of rage, leaves Yui and Mai behind going on the offensive, racing down to the military's base by himself to take on BD and destroy the supercomputer. Shogo snapped at this point, killing everyone, blowing up, and tearing down the military base with no regards at all and Yui breaks down as she's left alone, waiting for Shogo to come back. Shogo puts up a strong fight but loses in the end, getting beaten to a pulp and having to abandon the garland badly injured. He makes it back to the surface and is clearly broken, a dead look in his eyes as he mindlessly walks, and any ounce of innocence or naivety from the beginning is gone from his eyes. As we see all that's happened in this movie running through his mind, all his experiences, his relationship building with Yui, the war, the violence, all of the trauma he experienced of finding out that his world is a complete fallacy. Shogo's realized by this point that the world around him is a complete lie. Everyone is probably going to die when the aliens take the planet and there's nothing that he can do about it. The characters are one of the strongest parts of the series. Shogo's a wild card, a daredevil. The kind of dude that lives in trouble and risks his life just for the thrill of it. And that's why he keeps the garland in the first place knowing damn well that the bike was trouble. He starts off a naive punk boy and throughout the movie the weight of what's going on takes a serious toll on it. <laughs> Yui is more quiet and reserved, sort of a girl next door. She's got big dreams to perform on stage and kills herself every day working for it. Her and Shogo really balance each other out and they're wildly different personalities. It's part of what causes their biggest fights and it's also part of what makes them such a great couple in my mind. The main antagonist is BD, a cold stoic captain for the military. He's a man hardened by all he's seen in his time serving his country and maintaining their society, winning the war, that's all that matters to him in this film. He uses whatever means he has to to keep order. Even seeing flaws in his superiors, he and his men overthrow the government and he's seated as commander by the end of part 1. 
He and Shogo butt heads endlessly in the entire movie, and there's a clear rivalry going on here. With characters like this, the most important thing is to have a strong voice cast that brings them to life just the right way, and this anime succeeds in that. ADV Films dubbed Megazone in 2004, and that's the most notable one, but there's a pile more. The Harmony Gold dub of Parts 1 and 2, Parts 1 being linked to that shitty Robotech movie, and Part 2 being mostly faithful minus some name changes. When Johnny Winters gets that message, he'll flush him out into the open. Because that's definitely how. That's definitely his name. It's Johnny Winters. Not Shoko Yahagi, you know? Ugh, I'll bitch on that too. For the video, I'll mostly be covering the ADV version, but I will bring up some differences between that and the Harmony Gold dub that I prefer over this. I'm also going to happily rag on the shitty Robotech movie a little later. Shogo is voiced by anime legend Vic Mignogna, and he nails Shogo perfectly in every scene as that cocky, risk-taking punk boy. This baby's made up. <laughs> Son of a bitch! It's not over yet! I give up. Tell me where you found it, smartass. Jeez, oh, I'm talking to a nutcase. I want the truth and I want it now, you hear me? Yui's voiced by Allison Keith, and she does a great job, and I'm sure everybody knows who she is as, you know, Everybody's first waifu, Masato Katsuragi from Evangelion. You know what you just said? Excitement and danger, you're right. We're not really alive unless we're living on the edge. That Shogo was between me and him. Don't call me. Don't call, please. I promise I'll be back. I've got to stop him. Come back. BD is voiced by Gregory Snuff, and for this one I'll actually take Harmony Gold's BD over this. Michael McConaughey fits the stoic commander much better than ADV's more whiny sounding counterpart. I've got to admit, you've been a real pain in the butt. It's time I showed you how little you really know. Information so perfectly that only a few know they're living on a spaceship. The rest of the world goes along living more or less peacefully in what is in reality the illusion of something called the 20th century. At least that's how I see it. The side characters are pretty competently voiced, surprisingly, and they don't stand out as bad or lower quality like a lot of dubs at the time. The Harmony Gold dub came out in 1987, the Streamline dub came out in 1995, and the ADV dubs were 2004. Things could have been a hell of a lot worse considering how most dubs were being done at the time. Even Japanese is voiced by Kumi Miyasato who was only 16 at the time, providing all the Eve songs and a great performance as the AI with no previous acting experience. I mainly note her avidly because even in the English version, all the songs still use Miyasato's vocals. This is her only voice role ever. In ADV's dub, she's voiced by Monica Real, who's pretty good too. This idol is pretty much a propaganda machine to keep the citizens lulled in, and if they're gonna play the population, the music better be fucking good, right? Sentimental is perfect. No wonder everybody's obsessed with Eve. I'm obsessed with Eve, and she isn't even a real person in the anime. <laughs> Christ's sake. This song is Kumi's only one to get an official US release, and it was part of Japan's greatest hits at the time. It's a gem of a song that's more than deserved its place in anime history as one of the best songs ever made for an anime franchise. But I'm not done yet. Kaze no Lullaby is a theme of love, heart, and romance that lines up well with the sex scene. Yes, there's a sex scene in this, but because of the fact that most OVAs at the time were hentai, for the sake of boosting sales, they were like, we'll put some nip in here. Fuck it, why not? Who's complaining about some titty, am I right? Blues is a war anthem, the sort of song you'd expect to hear the World War II girls sing for the soldiers. It's part of the Eve propaganda machine later in the movie, and it's stupidly catchy. Never, never 
You got the Fast Paced Rock Cafe that completely gives you the urge to just race down a busy highway and get chased down by cops. Such a fun song, and I always have it on repeat. Hell, there's extended versions all over YouTube for a reason, right? From start to end, the first movie is a great ride, and I couldn't be prouder to recommend it to you guys. Go watch it, please. Part 1 did way better than anybody expected, selling over 200,000 copies and generating 1.7 billion yen, which is about $11 million. Part 2 released in 1986 to finish up the story. It's been six months since what happened in part one. The military and the government are losing, and the way it's animated, they're losing badly. The higher-ups have already tried contacting the enemy to surrender whilst BD is oblivious, still leading the troops into these suicide missions. BD is refusing to surrender on his end, and the leftover government have already planned to screw him over if necessary. But what about BD? BD isn't the only soldier out there. And with enough money, one can always buy another one. Sorry. The stress of it all is clearly getting to BD, and he's holding everything together on his own, and Shogo continues to get in his way. Eve has broken off from government control, keeping herself active in parts of the system they can't access, and has been putting out a call for Shogo for the last six months. Excuse me, Major, but aren't you attending the launch ceremony for the FX-101? Shogo's been in hiding because he was framed for the murder of Tomomi, and the manhunt on him is much stronger than it was in Part 1. In that time, he made friends with a biker gang called Trash, led by this guy, Lightning. Shogo finally returns from hiding and lives with them in an abandoned building. After kicking the shit out of the cops, Shogo and Yui finally reunite after six months. And it's not the love dove fairy tale meeting you'd expect, you know. Hi, baby! Mwah! We didn't get none of that shit. No. This is a level of maturity that I really do appreciate over American cartoons of the time. Yui is upset with Shogo for not contacting her once, and with how lonely and depressed we saw her at the end of part one, I can see why she's so upset. Couldn't stand the looks. There she goes, the lover of that murderer. And besides, how long could I keep waiting for someone who might have been dead? I'm not a strong person, Shogo. I can't survive alone. Scrutinized by everyone around her because she was with Shogo, Yui's been lonely for a long time. They're down in the dumps as their situation hasn't exactly improved since six months ago. The trash crew's base is a haven, for somebody like me anyway. Loud music, cigarettes, and beers for everyone. They've got fitted power, TV, sound systems, and food. It's a fun setting, and Shogo fits in well with the pack. Yui definitely feels out of place with these punk girls, but it's nice to see her making friends with the bunch, and I definitely feel like she fits in better by later in the movie. Even getting taught how to ride a motorcycle by the trash girls, which helps her keep up with the action a little later. Shogo and Yui make up and feel some stress in typical teenage fashion. They head off, get the garland back, and receive instructions from Eve to head to level 7 of Bahamut's computer. There's a strong bond between Shogo Lightning and the whole of the trash crew in this movie that he really didn't have in the last one. Shogo's not alone anymore. In the first movie, he was a one-man army taking on the corrupt government and military forces by himself. And now he's part of a punk biker gang raising hell in the streets, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the cops, military garlands, and choppers with machine guns. <laughs> what a bunch of fucking badasses. Shogo and the bunch are packing serious heat this time around compared to the last movie. Yui gets injured and Shogo barely makes it in with everybody sacrificing themselves to get him to level 7. He talks to Eve, finally, and has a pretty deep conversation with her that really stuck something in me the first time I watched it. And you know what? I'm gonna shut up this time and I'll let Shogo talk. You didn't join the army. Why? Because of the people that are running it. Guys like BD and Armstrong. I'm listening. Go on. BD treats people like insects. Either they follow his orders or he stomps on them. He thinks he's protecting society. What good does it do if the ones he's protecting are being treated like garbage? 500 years ago, your ancestors faced the same problem, Johnny, and it nearly destroyed them. There were those who were so obsessed with obtaining power that they would stop at nothing, including the destruction of the Earth, to get it. Those were the dark times. Mankind was dominated by hate and greed, and love became a worthless commodity. 
Johnny, I noticed how concerned you were for your friend Sue. In fact, I believe you said you loved her? That's right. Love can take many forms and can mean different things to different people. What does it mean to you? Well, it's kind of hard to put into words, but I know that Sue's more important to me than anything or anyone else in the world. I've never thought much about the future, but whatever it is, I know that I want Sue to be there to share it with. Eve, Sue is everything to me, and I hope to God she feels the same. You said that you wanted to share your life with her. How, Johnny? What would you share? Well, myself, first of all, and herself. I mean ourselves, getting to know who, who the other person really is. Go on. I mean letting the other person inside. Allowing them to see everything, the good and the bad, the stuff you're proud of, and the mistakes you wish you hadn't made, how you feel and think and, well, everything. You won't be young forever, Johnny. Do you think you'll feel the same way as an adult? I don't know, Eve. Not if I turn out like the ones I've seen. When I was small, I couldn't wait to grow up to be an adult. But that was before I knew what most of them were really like. I thought that adulthood <sighs> meant having your freedom. I was stupid enough to think that as a child. What a joke. There isn't any freedom, only rules. Rules for how to dress, how to behave, how to live, how to think. Don't get out of line, follow the rules, be like everyone else. If that's being an adult, then no thanks. Not me. All you have to do is choose. Who you turn out to be depends on you. But what about... all the rules? The old rules haven't worked very well, Johnny. Perhaps new ones are needed, and perhaps you'll be the one to make them. What do you mean by that? Eve, there's something you're not telling me, huh? I love this scene and it spoke to me in levels I can't really explain. God, I love this anime. And what the hell of a time it is for this to still be relevant. Some things never change about humanity, am I right? Eve and Shogo have one final goodbye. It's an evil caretaker, and I believe Adam will see that you're the right person for the job. How will I know? Don't give up hope. Goodbye, Johnny. <laughs> Shogo has one final confrontation with BD, who's realized by this point that Shogo's won. Adam wakes up midway, cutting their last fight short. Adam is the system created to completely erase everything. The Megazone 23 is going to destroy himself under Adam's command, with everyone on it, and return back to Earth. Everyone except Shogo and his friends dies by the end of this. BD gives his last words. And the new age begins. You're not scared? The world that we had was one worth living for. However, the time when I could live as I thought was right has ended, at least for now. And the truth is that I envy all of you for what will come. Shogo Yahagi, it's not likely that we two will meet again. BD. Big-headed show-off until the very end. In what a commendable form of redemption for the character. Hell, I felt bad for BD accepting the loss, and he's supposed to be an antagonist. I appreciate that he has a little more depth than just being a mindlessly evil villain like other cartoons released at the time. He takes off in style as usual with his arrogance, and we never see him again, sadly. Eve takes the stage one last time as the world comes down. It's horrifying and powerful to see the city we've watched these characters run around in be completely destroyed. Everyone dies, cities come down, and the animation is beautifully haunting. The Hard Rock Cafe comes down, the city streets fall and crash, and we see everybody fleeing in fear. Himitsu Kurasai builds up as the destruction gets worse, and it gives me the shakes every time I rewatch. 
This scene is so legendary there was a more recent anime that even parodied it. The only ones left alive after all of this are Shogo, Yui, and the members of Trash. It's almost a Noah's Ark, but sci-fi. Shogo's the chosen one, and he and his friends are all that's left of the world as it's wiped clean. They walk they to the surface of the healed earth. It's beautiful bright green field of trees and mountains. The sun shines, and Shogo and Yui hand in hand look on to the new world. There's a sweet moment of all the trash crew reuniting, and Lonely Sunset ends the movie. The music of part 2 has a couple less vocal themes, but the songs that are there fill the gap well. Miyasato returned and fucking delivered, baby. Himitsu Kudasai is Eve's final song of the series, supposedly, and it's literal perfection, powerful, high energy, intense, and it fits the end of the world that we watch on screen. If you want to listen to it, make sure it's the one that's 5 minutes 55, because the longer version contains a gem at the end that you need to experience. Lonely Sunset's a nice ending song that helps with the realization that this story is really over, man. There's a badass rock track as Trash rays hell in the streets. Keep on loving, which I've played already, is romantic and what it's meant to be for sex. <laughs> Christ's sake. <laughs> One note. One note though, the sex scene in part 1 is mostly making out naked and some nip, but part 2, I couldn't even show you a crop version of it. They show us every angle of what those two are doing and nothing is left to the imagination. Part 2 really is a lot more gritty, dark, and violent than part 1 overall, so this isn't really much of a surprise. Part 2 ends the story, perfectly topping part 1 in almost every way. <laughs> Art style, motherfucker. And there's no complaints at all for this. I recommend part 2 to you guys, 100%, no question. Moving on to the next end of this fucking series. My endless bitching begins now, alright? However, I've been blueballing you guys by not bringing up the art style, so I will do it now, since I'm sure it was confusing. 
I didn't want to break the immersion, but I didn't want to break the immersion by bitching about this earlier. So I was like, you know, I'll just keep it straightforward with the story explanation because I really do love parts one and two, and I didn't want to rag on him just yet. Character design on my in place of Mikimoto. While designing the secondary characters for Shogo's biker gang, Umetsu decided to also do iterations of the main cast and showed them off to Aitano. Aitano loved his designs, and loved them so much that he decided to change the designs of all the characters in the film to fit Umetsu's style. Hirano and the rest of the staff were furious, calling this change illogical and confusing. But Aitano defended his decision, and often had to defend Umetsu, who was hated by most of the staff at this point. On my first watch, I was both angry and disgusted by these new designs. It took me a solid 20-30 minutes before I figured out who everybody was. It didn't ruin my enjoyment, but it was still something I wasn't happy about. And it took a second watch to fully enjoy it once I actually knew who everybody was, you know? The new art style has grown on me, and I almost like it as much as part once now. But I don't think it should have happened either way. I will say, though, the 90s anime fashion kind of changed my mind. I had an exchange with her in the comments section where I said I hated the art style, and she actually convinced me that it wasn't that bad, and there was even some beauty to some of the frames. So, shoutouts to her. I used some of her clips in this video. Go check her Instagram out. It's good shit. Trust me. It's about time that I start trashing on Harmony Gold for their part 2 dub, where they changed all the names of the main characters because, I don't know, apparently Americans can't say Shogo Yahagi. Can open it. Very well. Once Johnny Winters gets that message, it'll flush him out into the open. We'll play a waiting game. Switch me over to Armstrong, Nick, and keep working on it. So, in this movie, they're called... Shogo is called Johnny Winters, and Yui is called Sue. The Harmony Gold dub was also marketed to children, which meant that a lot of the more violent or sexual scenes were completely cut. The sex scene is gone, and pretty much most of the gore or violence is completely cut out of the movie. Even if there are important conversations in or around these scenes, they were just sliced out. It takes away from the full story, and I kinda don't like that the Harmony Gold dub is the first one that I watched for part 2. The ADV dub, though, is completely faithful. Stick to it if you're a dub watcher. BD's voice is the only thing I will give the Harmony Gold dub over ADVs. And because I'm a petty prick, I'm adding to the icing on the cake of my ragging on Harmony Gold. The bastards had the gall... The bastards had the gall to advertise their shitty Robotech movie right after part 2 on the tape. The Robotech movie is a duct tape, super glued version of Megazone, dubbed with a completely different story and low-res clips from a completely different anime, Meshed in to fit with their messy writing. When I sat down to get some clips of the Robotech movie, I saw this shit at the start. Robotech, the movie, was the worst experience of my life. I feel bad for this fucking man. The man had, apparently the man had 24 hours to re-edit this entire thing because Canon Films didn't like Megazone's story and demanded it all be redone with more guns, less girls, and, you know... Typical 80s action. Mercury Falcon goes in depth on all this behind the scenes stuff, so I'll leave his video in the description because he goes over way more than I will. The thing I did find out in researching this is apparently Harmony Gold actually commissioned an extra 10 minutes of animation for the Robotech movie that I just ragged on. And surprisingly, with all the flaws in that movie, the extra animation footage actually looks as good as the original anime. You wouldn't even know it wasn't part of Megazone if I didn't tell you, right? Except for the fact it's obviously lower res than everything I've shown you before. Most Robotech fans either don't know the monstrosity exists, or agree that it's not a very good movie. But, there is the movie's soundtrack which is actually phenomenal. Songs like Saved by Science, The Future Is Now, and Underground are great songs that I actually really appreciate.
80s music that didn't disappoint, am I right? Part 2 is pretty much perfect, and I recommend leaving it there for Megazone. Part 3 doesn't exist in my mind outside of these two songs. Part 3, Part 2, Megazone 23, Part... I don't fucking... It, it's a stupid titling. Part 3, Part 2, Part 1, Part 3, Part 1, Part 3, Part 2. You already have a part. You can't have part, part... It doesn't make any fucking sense. I don't know, man. Part 3, to say it simply, is just trash. The animation ranges from passable to a fucking slideshow. Maybe we were too harsh on 7 Deadly Sins, because even that shit looked better than this. And it doesn't help the fact that the story is also embarrassingly boring. All the characters are exactly like the peri period. Who's on their period? Not me. Maybe it is me. I don't know. <laughs> Getting my monthly sometime. Maybe it's because I've been ragging on Harmony Gold so much. My flow started. My mistake. The story completely fucks over the ending of part 1 and 2 in this. Despite returning to Earth, humans are still under the control of a new supercomputer with some kind of life data shit, and the system wants to end the human race seeing no reason to keep them alive, which doesn't sound like a bad fucking idea. We are horrible. <laughs> Eve gets a robot body, and AG, the new protagonist, has to, you know, save everyone like Shogo had to before. Shogo apparently was meant to awaken Eve again, despite the fact they already had their final goodbye at the end of part two, and apparently he just abandoned Eve and just ignored her, which when she called him, which doesn't make any sense, you know? Because, I mean, if you watch part one and two, when Eve is calling for Shogo, she's on every fucking screen, every radio, and there is no way Shogo could have just ignored that shit. Excuse me, Major. It's like an ex-girlfriend who won't stop fucking bugging you. I don't know, man. It doesn't make any sense, and I, I mean, the writers had to have known this shit was a crock. AG is the new Garland Operator 7G, and in the most retarded form of self-awareness, AG goes on to prove my point in the beginning of Part 3's second half, okay, about this being a rehash. That I've been selected to take Shogo Yahaji's place? AG. I can take his place. And anyway, I don't want to miss out on the chance of trying out that Garland. Right. Even the writers had to have known this was bullshit. I mean, look at this. They blatantly had a moment of self-awareness where the main protagonist just acknowledged he's a replacement for Shogo, which annoyed me even more about Part 3. Part 3 was only made because Akira did well the year before, and the higher-ups at AIC wanted to get on the trend by reviving Megazone for the sake of money, man, you know? Money, 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 makes the world go round, yeah. I actually do like the art style and the main character designs, but I don't think it's enough to save the dumpster fire for me. I'm sorry. If I find one pile of gold and a pile of shit, I'm still gonna say it stinks, right? Watch it if you'd like, I mean. Apparently some Japanese fans like from comments I read liked it more than parts 1 and 2. Maybe you'll be one of them, but for me, I'm not recommending this shit to anybody. I sat my friend down for parts 1 and 2, which he loved, and when we got to part 3, he fell asleep. I'm not kidding, you guys. The ending also annoyed the hell out of me. No. Of me no, 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 no! She's mine, you AG, you son- She's mine! She's mine! Come here, you. <laughs> I need God. That's all I'm saying about part three before I give myself any more of a headache than I already have. Part three is Voldemort to me, I'm leaving it there. 
Even though it's damn near a chef's kiss in my eyes, it's fallen through in relevancy for all but a few diehards like me. It's an important part of anime history, yet it's barely talked about, which is something that I do hope to change with this video. Megazone was far ahead of its time with its concepts about corrupt government, media, the cyberpunk genre taking a whole new level in this series, the idea of a false reality that was done before the Matrix was even thought of. There's endless things to praise about this series about how far ahead of its time it was in its ideas. As well as all the little references to other American 80s media like my favorite movie of all time, Streets of Fire, Moonwalking a la Michael Jackson, and Thundercats. Shogo's speech in part 2 and the entire message about humanity, love, and life itself is incredible, and I'll continue to praise it. Finding any notable review outside of a couple was a complete challenge, so shoutouts to all of those guys too, like Boobop and all of the others, I'll link them down below, they made great videos. Kudos to Anime News Network, Wikipedia, Behind the Voice Actors, for all the extra numbers and information that I used in this video. I'm linking all the videos I found for my research down below, Kumi Miyasato's live shows, and all the music. Enjoy! This is my first row of video and it was hell to make, so I hope somebody likes it. The next meal I'll be chowing down on is Bubblegum Crisis, so wish me luck whenever I get that video out. The script's already done, it's just about editing, which took me forever, so wish me luck on that. See?